You're watching The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee. Envy still is not here. We got a guest in the building. He goes by the name of Mr. Scott Storch. What's going on? What's happening, my brother? Chilling. Happy to be here. You give him a rundown of uh, Scott's resume when it comes to music. So uh, they know, it's a long rundown. They know who's sitting here. But um, I watched on your documentary the story about the song You Got Me, The Roots featuring Erica Badu. And we know yeah. you early on from working with The Roots and then working with Dr. Dre, still Dre. You also produced that. Um, I mean, so much Justin Timberlake, um, 50 Cent. I don't even know. What would you what would you say if people asked you to run it down? It's difficult. It's, it's you know, What's 25 years of work. So, um, you know, some of the, you know, you've got some of the early highlights and then mm -hmm. there's... Uh, you know, I moved on to like the Beyonce stuff, mm -hmm. and, you know, Baby Boy, Naughty Girl, me, myself, and I. Um, well, I know you're a producer, but you got to talk to the mic. You, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, but yeah, like, you know, there's been Make It Rain, like, there's a, a lot of records. Everything. Over yeah. Basically. Scott yeah. Storch touched Yeah, it's everything. hard to pin it down, but. Mm -hmm. Been in the game for a minute. Is that the reason for the documentary? Because, like, when they mention, like, greatest producers of all time, your name doesn't really get thrown in the mix like maybe it should. Yeah, you know, I got I got a lot of records. Actually, I was talking to Swiss about that. I told him I was with the Smoke the other day. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it's about to go down. So you want to do but, a you know yeah battle against Swiss? No, no, we're, he's gonna <laughs> pair me up with somebody. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that's the homie. <laughs> but um, you know, it's 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 just the kind of thing where people have this perception of me as like you know some like douchey dude that like was messed up on coke and this and that, which I was for a while, but that's not who I am anymore. You know what I mean? That's that's something that anybody could go through, you know what I mean? I used to think of you like a, a talented Scott Disick. Like Scott, if Scott could do beats, <laughs> that's that's what I would think. You know what's crazy? Like during the course of, you know, pretty much my whole career as a, as a producer, I wasn't using drugs. I was smoking weed. And I built an empire on that, mm -hmm. and then I stopped making beats when I started with the other shit. Yeah, I heard that in your documentary. Like you got introduced to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hollywood found me. We'll just say. <laughs> Do you hate the person that introduced you to cocaine? Yeah, I mean, you know, you listen, we all make our own decisions. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I hate those that went along with it and I had all these yes men around me that didn't do anything. Like, yo, what is you doing? Right, you somebody I mean? needed to check you and be like, dude, you, yeah, yeah. your whole life is, you know, you're making so much money, you're doing so well, don't mess it up. Yeah, then when the accounts was empty, they was outie. <laughs> and you talk about that yeah. in the documentary, too, that a lot of people you felt like should have came to you, that you worked with, and people that yeah. you had good relationships with, and at least said something. Yeah. I mean, there are, a, a, you know, a hand, less than a handful of people that did that. So, you know, Joe Crack was one of them. Buster Rhymes was one of them. He took a trip to my house to talk to me. He was concerned, and, you know, a couple of people, but... That was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is kind of... Well, when did you know you went off the deep end? Because you got introduced to it late. How old were you when you started? I knew I was off the deep end, and I yeah. remained off the deep end for a five, six-year period. You know, I mean, I was just... After a while, I was just medicating myself and just trying to, like, you know, not even think about the destruction that was done. Was it that good? I never sniffed it. I smoked it in a blunt once by accident. Great high. It's good the first year, the first half a year. Yeah. And then it's just all, it's not a happy ending. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It just turns into something else. Did it affect your art? Or were you making like I wasn't making, no, no, no. Oh. When, it, the, when I started with that, I pretty much just stopped. I was somewhere off in the, the med, like in, you know, in Monaco on a boat somewhere with a bunch of broads and a bunch of coke. And it was just like, that was I was locked up in the studio for like 15 years, man, mm. and and like, I, my manager was just like you know keeping me safe, keeping me out of, you know, you know harm's way. And then when I made this discovery, I was out, and it was like I was out of the cage. And what made you want to try it though? I mean, it, you know what it is. Can I speak frankly? Of course. Pussy makes you do a lot of shit. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. You get influenced, men. You know, I don't give a shit who you are. You could be the strongest dude in the world. That happens to be some people's downfall. Yeah. So it was. The, it wasn't the coke. It was the combination of cocaine and pussy. So a woman introduced you to it. Or it was just. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Got yeah. you. Got you. Did you used to read stories about yourself and be like, "Damn, this sounds crazy," but it was true. Yeah. Listen, a lot of people, you know, I can't blame them for walking away. You know what I mean? Because, you know, who wants to be associated with that? But, you know, there's a lot of people that I made a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I made a lot of hits for that maybe should have had a little more concern for me. Now, what's your relationship like with Suge Knight? Because I know you guys had some issues. Um, I mean, there's really no relationship. I mean, he and I were neighbors. Mm -hmm. I moved into a house, and he was my neighbor. And 
it was at a really bad time for for me, and uh, I was going through a lot. So, you know, because I I remember reading that you like signed over your royalties or publishing or something. It, no, I mean it was just a deal that was going down. It was like you know some desperate money situation mm-hmm. to get like during that course of that whole period of my life. Right. But you know, you know the future is bright, and you know fortunately I'm happy, I'm healthy, and I'm earning. Good and you know does he working still, hard. Does he still own anything of yours? Shook? Hmm? Shook? No, he never owned anything. Okay, okay. He was you. just in the mix of a deal with some people that, you know, were trying to do a, a a portion of a catalog that I had and and buy it and you know there was a commission at stake for him and this and that. So it's interesting because you've been up, you've been down, and I know when you're down, you see who your true friends are. So do you do you feel like you have any real friends in the I business? do. I do. Okay, okay. And I think I mentioned to some of them already. But, Fat Joe. But yeah, Buster. I mean, I got some friends, you know, Steve LaBelle, you know, he, he kind of like took me under his wing and he's like my manager slash drill sergeant. And, you know, we grinding and we learning, you know, he's teaching me the new way of thinking about the music business. So having taken a hiatus, I got a chance to like rethink the mechanics of the way I make my music right. and the way the business is and mm-hmm. the way, you know, it's changed the streaming world and, you know, he was the one that urged me. He was like, yo, let's not go after all the veterans right now. Let's get you with the young, new artists, the A Boogies, the, you know, Trippy Reds, and this, that, you know. And and there's going to be a more of a future there for you. Let me ask you this. It, being that when you first started in the 90s and where we are today, right, and when you look at the whole process of making music and the streaming and everything, what do you think are some of the benefits to how we do and consume music now? And what are some of the drawbacks from your own experience from having started out? So I mean, early? I think there is, like back in the day, if you was in the studio and we were recording, you were really a talented person because just the tapes that we recorded on alone was $300 to record two songs on them. That's all mm. they could fit. Now we have a hard drive that fits a thousand songs for $200. And just like the studio time, this, that, the producer, everything coordinating it all. Not everybody had home studios. It was... Mm. You know, it was different, but you know, there's you know there's advantages to the fact that now everybody has a chance because you can put your music out and people can make their music at their house and and you know the cream rises to the top. People really actually this generation, I think, they they're not fooled easily. They they you know they know what the top of this type of music is for them. But mm-hmm. I say that all the time. As much as people complain about how whack shit is, the whack shit don't last. No, it don't at all. You no, know, the cream rises to the top always for real. So how did you figure out that it, and how did you manage to get it back together? Because you, at one point, you know, were worth like up to, was it like a hundred million dollars? Yeah, pretty damn close to that. Yeah. And yeah. then lost re- all of it? I spent it over a period of like just partying, you know what I mean? It doesn't, that ain't, that ain't nothing. Look, like people, the private I, there's jet. stories, there's stories of people I, I've heard about that three, four times that. Scott, and done that Mike twice. Tyson, no, no, Mike Tyson lost 300. Uh, but he, that's still, it's still a lot, it's still a lot to me, him, though. It's still a lot to know? me. <laughs> How much did you have? Me and Allen once? Iverson, boy, you know what I'm saying? We're the two worst from Philly. On that. How much did you have in the bank at once? At once, you know, at any given time, you know, 30 million, 25 million. But it was accumulated, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Did you ever feel like, let we me We were invest. doing, I mean, I was on the Forbes list. I made like, I don't know, like $18 million in 06 and mm-hmm. pretty damn close a few years past that, so. Had you ever like invested in anything, and or you were just like, look, I'm just living life. I mean, yeah, minimally. Mm-hmm. I didn't have the right team around me. Right. At early on, you know, I mean, I had I had people that it was like to the wheels fall off. Like they would just, you know, they were making their money and they would let me do. Like I had a financial people that would just let me do whatever the hell I wanted to do. So what was their point? Yeah, because <laughs> you know somebody's got to have their eyes on the road. Mm-hmm. You know. But it gets greater later. We get better at what we do as we get older. And, you know, life is being good to me. And I'm entering a new chapter in my life. And, you know, I'm still enjoying making music. And for a select few, I'm making beats for other people's albums. But right now I've kind of uh, evolved into the way that Khaled does it. I'm putting together, like, you know, a project. And I have some singles about to drop and with features. And And you got a story to tell. And let the industry work for me, you know. And you got a story to tell. Yeah. Was it hard to get clean? You know what? I just did it. It was hard. It took me forever because I didn't want to. I was like, all right, what am I going to do with myself? This and that. We're all we're scared of, you know, how that change is going to mm-hmm. be. And, you know, like I had all these drug addicts around me and like, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be able to hang out with these people anymore. Even if they were drug addicts, they were the people I knew at that time. 
So, you know, it just, it randomly, this girl came into my life, this girl Florence, um, she was from LA, ended up meeting me down in Miami and just saw what a mess I was. And, you know, she just was like, listen, <clears throat> maybe a geographic change will help you. you. Come come fuck with me, get clean, you know, move to LA, get you back working. A lot of cocaine in LA too. Yeah, but you know what? It's The party thing isn't the same. And you know what? I'm not like in the mix like that, but mm -hmm. just I was too close to too many people that had, you know, give me access to it in, in Miami. So she kind of painted me into a corner and it worked. And I literally, without any treatment, without anything, I just stopped. She bought me a pound of weed and I, she was like, just smoke this. A lot of people like, you know, like people, 12 step people or whatever, they would consider that transfer of addiction and this and that. Call it whatever you want. I'm not bleeding out of my nose. I'm not unhealthy, but I like smoking weed. I built an empire on it and it literally helped me overcome really bad addiction so dope so what yay lesson, marijuana what, <laughs> what lesson did you learn from like the financial humbling i mean i learned it's it's a, it's a lot flyer to have 30 million dollars <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure it was a process of um earning back trust from people too who you were supposed to have work with i remember reading a story about a girl who was like yeah i paid him all this money and then that was all bullshit yeah. That was one instance. Oh, There's a lot of people that tell stories. Yeah, there was that some was random crazy girl, but I just turned the mute the project down. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah. It was but not. as far as working with people, um, you know, did you have to earn back trust for some of these huge artists yeah. that you worked with and then have to have them understand like, okay, look, I'm in a better place. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I never really had bad experiences with people in the studio mm -hmm. because here it went from me working and delivering to doing drugs and not going to the studio. Right. So nobody ever got like a, a bad record for me okay. or a bad session. But except a couple clients like Dr. Dre, when it already went bad, you know, based on our history together, he was loyal to me and he was like, all right, come in, like, I'm fucking with you, like, let's do this. And then he would just look at me when I got there, like the next day after like being up for two days and banged up. And, and, he, and he, I remember him looking at me and he was like, yo, Scott, was the, the bite worth the bellyache? And I was like, you know. One time I collapsed in his studio. Wow. I was like hiding, I knew, I was like, I was so dehydrated and I hid behind the baffles of the mic poof and they didn't even know what was going on. I was just like on the floor having like damn near a seizure and shit. Wow. Yeah. So how did you and Dre's relationship end or has it ended? Did he just be like, yo, you, you know what? At some point it was just like, yo, enough is enough. But then, you know, through the grapevine, he heard like, yo, Scott's been sober for three years. He's working hard and this and that. So I got immediately invitation over to see him at the studio. And, you know, we kick it now. You know, so Eve introduced you to Dr. Dre? Hmm? Is that how, did Eve introduce you to Dr. Yeah, Dre? Yeah, yeah. So tell me that story. Man, it was my first trip to, um, to L.A. I was living in Philly. And I had quit the roots to pursue my career as a producer but I was still cool with them and still producing music for them. I actually did their biggest hit after I left The Roots. Mm -hmm. That was the You Got Me song. But right. So we went, we were doing this open mic thing that I would drive from Philly to New York every Sunday. It's called The Black Lily at the Wetlands. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like the keyboard player, uh, MD of the thing. And it was like, you know, open mic slash poetry and, and you know, freestyle, whatever. So they had one in LA. And we flew out to L.A. It was my first trip to, to L.A. at the Martini Lounge. And I ran into this girl who I knew from Philly. It was Eve. She hadn't popped off yet, but she mm -hmm. came. I hadn't seen her in a while. She was like, I was like, what are you doing out here? She said, I got signed to Dr. Dre. And you always gave me beats back in the day. You never tried to push up, nothing like that. And he was cool. So I want to take you out of all these guys here to go meet this guy. And um, I went. And I didn't have any, at the time we had dat tapes, you know what I mean, <laughs> instead of whatever, like with your beats on it. And I didn't have any dat tapes with me. So he was like, y'all just play the piano or whatever. So I sat down, I was nervous as shit. And I started playing this like, you know, kind of like that type of sound before it became the sound, but all that piano stuff that we created in the <laughs> early 2000s, <laughs> like a whole wave. And like literally within an hour, this dude, Larry, that he had like came back with a room key for a room, he had like 10 racks. And he said, Trey wants you out here to work on this project, you know, the Chronic 2001. So I was, like, blown away. I was, like, ready to go back the next day <laughs> to Philly to my eviction notice that I was yeah. about to get. And bam, it was just, like, immediately the next day after that, I'm working with Eminem 
and you know doing big egos the day after that and you know, meeting Snoop and all these people. It was crazy, man. Did you give Eve some kickback? Huh? Did Eve get to I gave Eve a Grammy after that. There you oh, go. Oh, yeah, you did Let Me Blow Your Mind. Me and Dre, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, when you and Dre collaborate, how does that go? Because people always say Dre doesn't do his beats. He just takes the credit. No, no, that's not true. Dre is, listen, he's very hands-on. Mm -hmm. Man, he's a, he's a very technical dude. I'll see that dude come into the studio with, like, EQs and crazy compressors from the 70s and shit that people don't know about. Mm -hmm. He's genius. He programs the beats. You know, all, a lot of all the stuff that we've done together, he's orchestrated it. And like, say, me and this dude, Mike Elizondo, who's the guitar primarily guy at the time and bass, he plays little keys too. Um, he would like listen to us play over these drum tracks that he would make and he would be able to identify what is the hottest stuff that we play and he'd be like, yo, that's it. And you know what I mean? And, you know, he could articulate what he wanted and he knew how to bring the best out of us and push the bar up even higher. He doesn't seem like a selfish individual, though, because he always nah. bigs up the people he works with. Yeah, no, he's good people. You know, I, I had, to, when we did the Chronic 2000, I damn near did, like, the whole album with him. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, he and Mel Man had produced that whole album. That's what it was. It was an agreement. And, you know, you have to start somewhere and earn your stripes. So mm -hmm. I went down as, like, the writer of a lot of these songs instead of the producer, per se. But as I grew with Dre, after that album, immediately, it was like co-produced by Scott and Jordan. Mm -hmm. and it was love. So I don't know any of those rumors. If There's no truth to that shit. Did he test you when you first got back? Like, hey, let me make sure you clean. Like, No, nah, he could tell. He yeah, knew. Yeah. It was enough people, solid people in, involved. You know, It's pretty obvious. I used to look like a fucking raccoon. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, my eyes is clear these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't take my sunglasses off before. It was... That's what everybody was saying. It was like, he's going to keep his sunglasses on the whole right. time. That's yeah. <laughs> no, it's just my thing. So have y'all collaborated on music? We about to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. We about to do some stuff. I just talked to him a couple of days ago. So. Did you have a lot of instances um, during this time period of women trying to like get with you for some beats? Yeah. Those guys storage beats were like six figures. Yeah. I mean, I guess I kind of abused that. I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, I, I um, you know, at, a, at one point, in, in my life, I, you know, it was normal for me to have like six or seven girls with me at all times, and they was all knew that it was, had to be cool with them and this and that. I was just abuse of power. I mean, I didn't, you know, I was never like, you know, a bad dude. Everybody was always cool, but you know, I, you know, that was my thing for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, living in South Beach, you have that kind of life. You was in the position of power. Yeah. And a lot of times, when you're in that position of power, you think that comes with the position. Yeah. Yeah. And people are drawn to you too because they know you paying for everything. Mm -hmm. You dated Lil' Kim at one point, right? Yeah, she's like family, man. She yeah. was, me and her were more like friends. I think that the, the media kind of like really took that and pushed it out of the, you know, into something else. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Any of those women stayed? I legitimately cared about her as a person, you know what I mean? So as I'm a sure friend, you still do. more as a friend, yeah. Yeah. Any of those women uh, stayed down with you when you was like going through your downfall? Not really. None of them. I mean, yeah, it was, you know, I lose, lose touch. I mean, I alienated myself. So. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe you weren't receptive to yeah. that, too. Yeah. You know. What about your family? Like, your mom and everything, were they like, okay? Yeah, they got their own problems. Like, you know, fortunately, I was saying this yesterday, but, like, I'm so happy. One of the greatest things about my sobriety and, and getting my life back together and starting to earn money again and all that is being able to be that person that takes care of everybody. Mm -hmm. Like my brother and my mom, my dad, like, you know, I'm the only breadwinner ever for my family. So wow. when I dropped the ball, they all suffered. They were like, what do you mean I gotta get this Benz back? What do you mean? You know what say? <laughs> <laughs> but you get royalty checks in publishing, right? Yeah, no, yeah. I, mean, they, I mean, you know, those are, you know, it is the catalog of, you know, when I had like all the massive stuff, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of that stuff is, it's been spoken for and is in the rears or whatever it is. But, you know, the future is bright. I'm doing some cool stuff and evolving uh, with the type of business that I do. So. so you have a marijuana business as well. Small, yeah. A sm that's, okay. that's a hobby. It's a hobby. Yeah. And then you are back working, like you said, A Boogie, Trippy Red. So who are some people that you are seeing in the future for yourself? I mean, I'm working with a lot of people. I like to work with Jeremiah a lot. We, me and him are neighbors. And, I like Jeremiah. Yeah, he, we live a couple Jeremiah of houses away from each other, album. literally. So he walks over mm -hmm. and, like, we'll, we'll cook up. And, you know, I mean, I work with a lot of I'm working with a, really a lot of people right now. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I got a record coming out with T.I. and Yo Gotti. 
mm. Derez Deshaun, uh, you know, French, uh, Chris Brown, a lot of, you know, I mean, too many to mention, but right. uh, we back active. But my first record that I got coming out as a single um, is Ty Dolla, Trippy, and Fat Joe all on one record. Wow. Yeah. So when you talk to these young artists today, you know, you see them blowing their money, throwing their money all over the gram. What do you think? Like, have you ever given them any advice? Like, I know a lot of it is a show. Okay. A lot of it. I don't believe a lot of the stuff I see on Instagram. Mm -hmm. No matter how real it looks, it's, you know, an illusion. Instagram's a drug in itself. I, well, it's another conversation. But um, I don't know. I see a lot of people making a lot of big mistakes. And I see, I was saying this to my boy that owns Pristine Jewelers yesterday, Avi. I said, man, a lot of these cats are going to be broke. Mm. I'm just watching them do everything I did. And the, the drug thing is more prevalent now than it is Hell back when. Yeah. Like when I was in the hip hop community, was frowning upon yes. that. You, we rapped about selling drugs, not now doing we're them. Now we rapping about using drugs. Now we rapping about using them, and the kids are glor they're glorifying it. And you know, it's it's, it's, it's going to be some health issues. It's going to be some rehab overflows with issues that have a hip hop rehab. Well, that's when your testimony comes in, though. Like your testimony can save some kids if they hear you how you lost your money, how your health that's was. A documentary. Yeah. Take yeah. a look at that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. What made you want to live a billionaire lifestyle with millionaire money? What does that even mean? You know what happened? Honestly, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, but a particular girl came into my life. And, um, you know, I wasn't even really all that attracted to her or even like that, but it was just the idea of this girl because she was powerful at the time. And I wanted to impress her, so I wanted to play this role. And, you know, I remember I had this amazing paid-for 90-foot uh, yacht. It was all paid off, everything. And this girl was coming to town. You know, I had to get a 130-foot yacht. So I made all these arrangements and went into Hawk trying to buy this, you know, $18 million boat and this and that to impress. Like like the other one wasn't good enough. Yeah. Just some, some psycho shit. Was she a billionaire? Did she come from a billionaire family? Kind of, yeah. Kinda, not not really, but, you know, yeah. you would think they were. Damn, women but, have been your downfall. <laughs> uh, yeah, like it was it was like a weird thing, though. You know what I mean? So you it was spent obsession. $18 million dollars on a yacht just to impress a woman, and you had a 90-foot yacht already? Yeah, like d dumb shit, man. It's only 20 more feet. I know. <laughs> like, I mean, Jesus. Dude, you know. what, what was the extra 20 feet for? Yeah, definitely a mistake. What do you think uh, your most stupid purchase was? <laughs> Oh, I made a lot of those. <laughs> he said, I can't I made a lot remember. of those. I remember one time I could ran out of shit to buy. And I was like, I used to go to this dude who like get stuff from Saudis and like they would trade stuff. They do these things where they all trade like crazy items. And he had these five perfume bottles with all with multicolored diamonds, flawless all over them. It was like $700,000 or something For crazy. For perfume bottles? For perfume bottles. And then I had some drunk girl in my, sitting up on my bathroom sink or whatever, knocked one of them over and just broke it. I didn't even think twice about it. Damn. Yikes. Yeah. Just because. Just because. Do you, I mean, of course you regret all of that. Yeah. But, you, <laughs> but you also lived life, though. I remember Diddy is my neighbor, and he would come over and he was like, Scott, are you selling heroin or something? What's going on here? <laughs> like, you doing something. You would look around like... Mm -hmm. We had a, 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 a motorcycle on a conveyor belt in the entrance to my house. Like, it was some crazy shit. For no reason. For no reason. Jesus Christ. What do you think it is about Philadelphia that impacts people to make such great art? Philly is a lot of struggle, and there's a lot of, man, there's so much music there. Yeah. Um, it's just a great town, a lot of it's culture of there. And, you know, it's, I met so many people that were like the the actual sound of the 70s that were there that were under Gamble and Huff I don't know if mm -hmm. you know who those guys are Kenny Gamble yeah and these guys are all in hock right now like I was told that all these writers in this one studio Sigma Sound back in the day you'd see a whole parking lot filled with Cadillacs and not, nobody had no money and this and that so a lot of struggle over there it's just a lot of talent mm -hmm. and um, you know I had a lot of success with one of my brothers from Philly EST I don't know if you know from Three Times Dope I know the group. I don't know the yeah. individual, though. Yeah. I, I ended up convincing Beyonce back in the day that, that he was an accomplished R&B writer. He never wrote nothing. I just <laughs> knew he was struggling. And he came in and he wrote all those songs on Dangerously in Love With Me. Damn. Really? Yeah. And You're a good she, yeah. guy, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> so he make, he he got he, he got paid a lot of money then. Yeah, the life changer. And yeah. he was, you know, everybody thought it was a rap. Did you tell Beyonce that you lied to her after the fact? Yeah, yeah I mean, she knows the story. <laughs> she knows now. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> But it worked out, so hey, fake it till you make it. <laughs> I see. I see you wearing your star David too. Did your faith clash with any of the lifestyle? I mean, I wasn't exactly the most religious person at that time. 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, um, I'm not really a very religious person, mm-hmm. but you know, more spiritual these days. All right. Well, Let's... you keep some money for a fresh sweatsuit. I know that much. <laughs> Who's your nice. sweatsuit connect? You got to put me on. <laughs> oh, man. I think it's Barney's. <laughs> <laughs> you know this guy. And they ain't hooking me up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Scott Starr's the new documentary, Still Storch, is on Vivo. And yep. As we know, you have a lot of music coming out and stuff right now. So your first single is Ty Dolla Sign. Trippy Red. Red and Fat Joe. Yeah, it's called Suicide Doors. Okay, makes do you, sense. Do you want people to follow you on social media? Or you don't need that kind of temptation. Yeah, Scott Storch official. No, okay, you got temptation. You. I don't know. Temptation. Girls in his DMs hitting him up with mounds yeah, of coke. No, I'm like, honestly, wifey runs my whole shit. So hey, they'll get cussed the fuck out. You know what's crazy to me that I feel like you know I saw on your documentary and you talk about impressing women, but at such a young age and a talented artist that you were, like even being out and about making money from the age of twelve, I would think you always had girls. Yeah, I mean, I I did, but you know, I was. So like literally like I was like a, an asset for my manager at the time. So he like kept me away from everything. Like, mm-hmm. It was like I was always in the studio. I was always like my boys would come in from the club. I would let them use my cars. I had a Rolls Royce in the parking lot at the Hit Factory, but I never was at the club. I would let them take my car. They would go and tell me how the club was when they got back, or or bring some joints back with them, or whatever. You were just but, too sheltered, and then you just yeah. Ah. I mean, you know, there was like, how are you gonna say no to these clients, back to back clients in three rooms? Yeah, you know I mean. So. All right. Well, that's my man Scott Storch. You follow Yo, Scott thank you Storch so much. official. And yes, we're very sir. Happy thank you for to coming. See you back and clean, yeah, yeah. And clean, sober. And Gets greater later. <laughs> it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club.